Top of the morning to you. If you're just waking up and you're tuning in to the SABC News Channel, you know that at this time every week we have uh, the program Media Monitor and we're right in the middle of it. And uh, there's been quite a lot of things happening on community radio this week. Uh, the 15, uh, 17, 15 uh, community radio stations uh, were suspended for non-payment, uh, but uh, apparently they'll be reconnected. And this follows a meeting uh, between the new communications minister, Nomvula Muganyane, the National Community Radio Radio Forum, the Media Development and Diversity and uh, Signal Distributor Centec, who had uh, blocked the signal of a number of community broadcasters for not paying for the service. It's uh, reported that a total of 108 community radio stations are in arrears, collectively owing Centec more than 30 million rand in outstanding fees. Here in studio is uh, Centec's Head of Corporate Affairs and Communications, Melissa Kentane. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Peter. All right, so 30 million rand is, is a lot. Um, and, I, and I guess partly you need money to function, um, but community radio is really important. So did you have to suspend these stations? Was that something that you felt was the only way to go forward? Well, Peter, um, the suspension of the community um, radio broadcasters was really a, I would call it a last resort. I mean, if you look at what has been happening, um, we've been communicating um, the arrears since 2016. So it's a 30, some of them ha we've been communicating for more than 30 months. So we had gotten to a point where we were saying we, we have got to at least do something. So we are aware of the importance of community broadcasters. We've had very long and good relationships with community broadcasters. But we had to get to a point where we were looking at the business as a whole and the sustainability of state-owned companies is very critical. All right, so on Friday, Minister met with the stakeholders. What came out of that meeting? Well, Peter, the meeting was very progressive and it came out with very good results, um, I think. We appreciate the Minister's intervention, um, actually. Um, so she did um, request that Centec come through and meet with all the stakeholders that were affected by the suspension plan that we had started implementing. And there was an agreement that we reached in that meeting. And we were requested that based on the agreement um, from the parties in that meeting, we should switch on the community broadcaster. So we had started phase one and we had suspended 17 at that point in time. All of them have now been switched back on. So immediately after that meeting and the agreement was in place, we then started switching the community broadcasters back on. All right, okay. Let's just hear from the minister herself and just to see what her thoughts were on this issue. The fact that community radio stations or community media, the community media sector um, hasn't been receiving any sufficient support um, you know, from the state. Um, we know that the history of South African community media has been one of painstaking resilience. So I think, on, on the one hand, um, yes, it may do, it may have to deal with affordability, but I think it largely it deals with um, policy gaps around um, having sufficient support for, for, for the community radio media sector. Um, so I think that needs to really be addressed. All right, so as you can see, that's not the Minister of Communications, uh, but uh, a concerned uh, a citizen, as uh, most people have been watching story, this story unfold. So uh, they're switched back on, but you're still broke. So <laughs> what, what was agreed that's going to help you, Asentec? Well, um, we, uh, I won't say that we are still broke. Yeah. Obviously, what we had been saying was we needed to have payments agreements in place. So if you remember when we switched off the 17, within that same week, four came back and agreed to the payment proposals and we had an agreement in place. And then we agreed on the payment agreement. They did pay a certain amount and then there would be an installment um, process that would take place. So what we were looking for really was commitment that the, the payments will take place. Because if you look at it, Peter, if we're gonna spend 30 months trying to get you to at least have some kind of payment agreement um, with us. It, it made the situation very difficult. So when, when we had the meeting um, with the minister on Friday and there was progress and an indication that, you know what, there, will, there is an agreement, we will support um, the community broadcasters. Obviously, we'll be 
looking at the details as the week continues. Mm. So during this, this coming week, the details of ex exactly what that agreement will entail. But we have switched back on because there is that commitment that payments will happen. All right. So, you know, as is the public broadcaster, the SABC, we know how difficult it is uh, to make any kind of money, and um, particularly for radio. And I would imagine that it's even worse for community radio stations. Mm. So how do they make their money? Uh, because clearly the only way to fix this is for them to have a sustainable model that they can work with so that they can make money to pay you. Yes, but um, I think, Peter, where we come from is the perspective that we are a service provider or a supplier of signal distribution. Mm -hmm. So we have individual contracts with each um, community radio broadcaster. And in that agreement, they, 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 they it clearly stipulates that we're going to render services, they're going to pay for those services. So that is, the, that is really the agreement in place. Because in order for us to provide those services, we need to actually get money coming in. You have to consider the fact that we have to pay electricity, we have to pay pay rental space for, for the satellites that we rent <laughs> out in space mm -hmm. and, and all the other um, costs that the organization has to pay for. If we agree that community radio is essential, particularly for things like uh, furthering democracy, communicating with people, particularly on ground level, mm -hmm. and we can already see that some of them are not going to make it, they, they, don't, they just don't have the infrastructure. And I would say even e particularly in the rural areas where they're mostly needed, they're going to struggle. Mm -hmm. Might we need to find another way to fund Centec? Well, I think we need to have an understanding, Peter, that you know we've got state-owned companies and we've mm. got government department. So mm. state-owned companies have a developmental agenda, yes, but we also have a commercial mandate. So we have to make sure that we are not draining the, 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 the state fiscus. So we have to be able to stand on our own as a state-owned company, which Centec has been doing very well over the years. Um, but I'm very pleased that there is some kind of government intervention in that space. So that, that is an engagement, I believe, that the community broadcasters with, with, with government and obviously the other state-owned um, agencies that actually are involved in that space will be able to resolve that. What is government going to do? I mean, what have they said to you? Are they going to give you some money? Well, um, Peter, we're not, we're not really the government itself, yeah, yeah. so obviously we can't really say what it is that they are going to do, but at least there has been some commitment that there will be support to community broadcasters, if you look at what was said by the minister, as well as some of the support on financial training and administration and all the engagements that they want to have with the community broadcasters. So we, we are hopeful that with that arrangement, the community broadcasters will stand. Um, I, I also want to state that, you know, that obviously the community broadcasters versus commercial, um, they obviously their tariffs and, and, the, and the requirements are not the same. Mm. So at this point in time, we have really lowered as much as we can mm. and we, it, w with um, remaining sustainable as the organization as well. All right. So uh, one of the things that I'm also concerned about, 1992, when community radio stations started rolling out, there, there, were, there, were, there were none. And then all of a sudden, I think we're well over 200 now. Could it be that we are over licensing and there's just too many for the number of people that are out there? Well, um, Peter, we don't license the community broadcasters, mm. unfortunately. Okay, so you're going to leave that. <laughs> 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 Let me introduce uh, Tebo uh, Dishako, who's a media analyst and he's going to be helping us uh, look at our newspapers in a short while. Uh, Tebo, this community radio story, I mean, it is a concern. And I, I just wonder what your take is, uh, is on it, because clearly, commercially, we can't license until the cows come home. Yeah. At some point, we have to say, Th there's only so many South Africans, there's only so much money that can be made, and we have to stop licensing. Do you think that ICASA gave too many licenses, that we're in a situation now, or are they just being poorly run because you've got hot 90.1 that's beaten everybody at the Liberty Awards, mm -hmm. so, and Josie FM, which have proved that community radio stations can compete when they run well. Are the others, these 15, 17, just poorly run? What's the story? Well, that's a very complex one, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you spoke about the funding model. Um, I don't think that there's over-licensing. Um, I think, you know, we, we have an issue in South Africa, um, an economic issue of inequality. We have a social issue also of inequality. 
And these community radio stations are the voice of the voiceless. They do provide a platform you know, for their issues to be uh, raised. Um, and it, it is a, a, um, a medium that actually fills the gaps that mainstream media um, doesn't have the resources to fill, or perhaps has been neglecting to fill. Um, another thing is that in terms of our unemployment rate, once you've switched off the signal, people are going to go hungry. Mm -hmm. People, uh, their voices are going to be shut down. Um, so we cannot look at it only primarily as a commercial issue. Um, we also have to look at it from a developmental standpoint. Um, obviously, you know, my colleague from Centec um, is limited in the scope in which she can communicate how this thing can be resolved, because she's not the Department of Communications. She's not ICASA. Mm -hmm. um, so in this conversation, we need to have the Department of Communications and ICASA so that we can look at the funding model of Centec and of these community radio stations. I think, broadly speaking, also my industry, the media industry, um, advertising industry, must also come to the party you know, to advertise in community platforms in order for them to become sustainable. Because you will find that the founder of Hot 91.9 um, has other business interests and has good connections that can link um, the, the, the station to mm -hmm. the advertising revenue. Yeah, in fact, it's, it's starting to happen already. Statistics are showing that a lot of community radio is being used, uh, particularly where languages are concerned. We had invited the, uh, the National Community Radio Forum uh, president, um, Duduzi Banana, to join us on, in studio, but uh, hasn't come through. Perhaps he might still, I'm not sure, but uh, we wanted to get their opportunity. And perhaps just as an indicator, I don't know if, if it is, I went on their website, the NC... RF to see, get some information, and guess what? It's been closed down due to non-payment. And I think this speaks volumes, really, to the plight of community radio. And I'm just wondering, and perhaps for both of you, but you know, you're, you're a signal distributor, but it, it's <laughs> much of what you're saying suggests this is public broadcast. So should they be under the SABC or? Well, that's <laughs> I, I don't think the SABC would um, have the capacity to manage them. I also think that in, from an independence point of view, you know, having them being ind independent does strengthen our democracy um, because they can make their decisions without thinking about the overreaching editorial policy of the, of the SABC. So I think the model currently is fine, um, but the problem comes in the funding model also, um, us understanding their, their, their agenda, because, you know, I work in the public relations industry. You'll find my clients will be having an event in the KZN, and they have paid for PR, mm -hmm. um, and, and they haven't had a budget for advertising. And you'd contact them, and they'd even travel to the event to inform the community, because it is an important event. Mm -hmm. But then they don't have the resources um, to continue like that without you having to pay. And so that, right. that becomes a bit of a challenge. Okay, all right. So unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there for the time being. But Melissa, thank you very much for joining us. And I guess the big story is that you're switching them back on and that discussions are underway and hopefully long-term solutions are in play. I think, Peter, though, just to, to, to add there, is that it's very important to understand that Centec also thinks community broadcasters are critical. And that is why it has taken so long for us to, to get to this point. But as we said, we will be looking at how we can assist the community broadcasters. But for, as we said, we're very pleased with the minister's intervention and we'd really look forward to furthering the working relationship there. All right, so Centex, so Melissa Cantani, thank you very much indeed. So we'll continue our conversation after this short break. Stay with us.